Glad to be with the saints here in LA. Uh, though I know a few of you, but uh, it's good that we could get reconnected after a long period of time. Turn with me to the second epistle that Peter wrote. Second epistle that Peter wrote. Yeah, children, I want you to be very smart. Um, usually in my meetings, children, they listen more carefully even than the adults. And I'm sure that should be true even here. So take a paper and whatever I write on the board, you are going to write it down. Okay. So get a paper, get a pen, and write it down carefully so that uh, you remember what I'm going to teach you. So Second Peter chapter one. So take your portions. Did you take Second Peter chapter one? chapter 1 and we are going to read the first 11 verses. The first 11 verses. Okay. Second Peter chapter 1 and the first 11 verses. Okay. Shall we start? I will start with verse 1 and uh, read loudly verse 2. Okay. Yeah. Verse 1 I am going to read and verse 2 we are going to read loudly. Yeah, where is your Bible? No Bible? Yeah. All children take your Bible. Open to 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, yeah. So here we go. Shall I start? Are you all ready? Ready? Yes? Okay, good. Simon Peter a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 3, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. If you notice carefully, this is one single unbroken sentence. So it's all divided into four verses. If you see, right from the first word, till we came, the world through lust. So there you get a period. Okay. So it's one full sentence. Okay. Just keep that in mind. Now we will start from verse 5. From verse 5. I will read verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Seven, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Once again, you notice five, six, and seven is the second unbroken sentence. It is one single sentence, though it's divided into three verses, five, six, and seven. That becomes one sentence. Then eight becomes a sentence by itself. So now I'm going to read nine, nine. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
Verse 11, all of us shall we read together. For so, and ever shall we minister unto you a murder in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Shall we pray once again? Loving Father, we thank you for these beautiful words that the Holy Spirit made Peter to write. And we believe it has got a very strong, relevant message for us in these end times. Pray that you would open our eyes of understanding that we may understand thy word, receive thy word, apply thy word to our own lives so that we may be fruitful in our Christian lives. Lord, help us. We pray this with thanksgiving in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, verse 19, just the verse 19, we have also a most sure word of prophecy, wherein do ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise, in your hearts. Now Peter is talking about the word of prophecy and he calls it as a light that shines in a dark place. Now before I say something more on verse 19, I said that uh, this passage of 11 verses, there are actually four sentences. The first sentence verses 1 to 4, second sentence verses 5 to 7, and then 8 is a sentence by itself, ninth is a sentence by itself, and 10 and 11 together, they become the fifth sentence. So, let us try to understand this. Second Peter, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, you can say it speaks about the riches of Christ. Speaks about the riches of Christ. Available to every believer in the world. Whoever is willing to take it, yes, God is willing to give it to them. We are going to see in detail what those riches are. And then uh, from verse 5 to 7, we see the responsibility of the believer. See the responsibility of the believer. The response and responsibility. If he knows so many riches are available to him, what is he to do? How should he respond to it? Yeah? And then verse 8 speaks about the rewards. The rewards for the true Christian, for the true child of God. Who knows the riches, responds to the riches. The true child of God. What are the rewards that God has reserved for them? And then verse 9 speaks about the ruin. The ruin of the pseudo-Christian. He has an external semblance of a believer, but he is not a true believer. So what's the ruin? that he's going to face at the end of his life. So having talked about all these things in verses 10 and 11, Peter has got a strong word of admonition. He says, review your own life. Examine your own life. In fact, in verse 10 he says, make your calling and election sure. Make it sure. You know, in life we make sure several even small things, even taking a small journey. For example, in the train, you want to make sure that you have preservation. You don't need chances. That will be for a few hours, but still you want to make sure that you really got a reserved seat for a birth. In small things we are very wise. Are you sure that you will get to heaven one day? 
Are you sure that you will enter into God's kingdom? Well, this passage talks about how we can be sure. How we can be sure. In fact, in verse 10, he says, Make sure your calling and election. If you do these things, you shall never fall. Oh, that's a great word of assurance. You will never fall. And then in verse 11, he says, If these things abound in you, and if you really are careful in all these things, you will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. You will never fall. You will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. If, nine, if 10 and 11 has to become a reality in our lives, what necessary steps should I take as a believer as I live in this world? Now that's going to be our task. Because in verse 19, he goes on to say about a more sure word of prophecy, which is like a light shining in a dark place. We thank God, God has not left us in the dark. God has not left us to speculate. He has spelled out very clearly in God's word as to how you and I need to prepare ourselves. If we have to have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God, how we, we need to make sure our calling and election show. How to make sure that I am really saved? So that's a question. And this passage is a part of that answer. Now let's go on to the first one. We will start with the riches that are available in the Lord Jesus Christ. What are the riches that are available in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you look carefully in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 as we saw, in these four sentences, in these four verses, which together comprise only one single sentence, he talks about several things. See verse 1. He says, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Two things in verse 1. Number 1, he says, we have obtained the righteousness. And then precious faith. Then when we go on to verse 2, he says, grace and peace and knowledge we have obtained. Grace, peace, knowledge. Then when we come to verse 3, he says, his divine powers have given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So divine power we have received. Divine power. Then all things that pertain to life and godliness. That pertain to life and godliness. Then when you go to yeah, verse 4, go to repeat off. Yeah, one four. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these he might be partakers of the divine nature. Precious promises. And then divine nature. Hey children, can you count how many of them I have written down? Only four? One by one. How many? Nine, yes. So there are nine specific things that we can talk about when we talk about the riches that God has made available to us in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. By giving us Christ, 
at least in this one single sentence, Peter talks about nine fold riches that God has made available to all of us, to the whole world in fact. First thing is righteousness. None of us are righteous. The Bible makes it very clear. Romans 3.10 All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, Romans 3.23 And the Bible says We are all sinners before God. But what we never achieved or earned God has gifted it to us. So righteousness of God is a gift given to us. Now where do we read that? We read that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans 5.17 The gift of righteousness. The theological word used for righteousness is the word justification. Justification. That means God declares a sinner just on the merit of the blood of Jesus Christ. I go as a sinner. I go as a wretched, hopeless sinner. But God gives at the foot of the cross His own righteousness that I never earned. It's so beautifully illustrated in the story of the publican and the Pharisee who went to pray in Luke's Gospel chapter 18. You know, a long prayer the Pharisee makes, but then the publican smites his breast. He wouldn't even look up to heaven and he cries out, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then what does the Bible say? Verse 14, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. So God gave him his righteousness. Actually what that man asked was, be merciful to me a sinner. The Greek word that he used for merciful is, be propitiated, which means, let not your anger fall on me. It's like you have offended somebody so deeply that you go to him and beg him, oh don't be angry with me. Because sometimes children do that, isn't it? You offend your dad and mom and you broke something at home and you know they are going to spank you. But then you go and say, oh, don't get angry with me. Now, that's a kind of attitude. So, this publican, he only asked, don't be angry with me, Lord. I deserve your wrath. I deserve your indignation. But please don't get angry with me. But when heaven answered, it answered and gave him what he never asked. He never asked for righteousness. God not only forgave him, God not only pardoned him, but instead, God chose to give him his own righteousness, which he never asked. That's the love of God. That's the goodness of God that happened in our lives. We are all recipients of God's righteousness. That's why Paul calls believers as saints. Often he addresses them as saints. In fact, that word saints comes 101 times in the New Testament, most of them referring to believers. And secondly, God has gifted to us precious faith. You think we'll be able to believe on God? No. We are incurable doubters. We are skeptics. Faith is a gift from God. Acts 11.17, Ephesians 2.8, Philippians 1.29. These three verses tell us that faith is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. So God gives precious faith, something so precious, God gives us. Right? Just try it one day, Acts 11, 17. Yeah. The third thing that God gave us was grace. In the Bible often you come across the word grace and also the word mercy. Grace and mercy. Telugu for grace you use the word kurupa and uh, Mercy use the word canical. Now there is a small difference between these two words. The word mercy, kanikaramu means God not giving me what I actually deserve. That is mercy. I deserve his wrath. I deserve his anger. But God does not put it on me. But what is grace? Grace is God giving me what I don't deserve. What I don't deserve. Can somebody read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9? 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Uh, 
Christ. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That. That. Though he was rich. Though he was rich. Yet for your sakes. Ah. He became poor. He became poor. That. He, that. He through his poverty. That you through his poverty. Might be rich. Might be rich. So on the cross, Christ became poor for your sake and my sake, that He might pour out His riches on us. So that's how we are rich in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is grace. Grace is God giving me what I don't deserve. Yeah? And grace is the cause and peace is the result. Romans 5.1, it speaks about peace with God and Philippians 7 it speaks about the peace of God. This is with God and that is of God. So there are two dimensions to divine peace. Number one is peace with God, Romans 5, 1. That is reconciliation. Unless we are reconciled to God, unless we deal with the sin issue in our life by confession, by repentance, we cannot be reconciled to God. But once we are reconciled to God, we have the privilege of pouring out our burdens before the Lord. That's why in Philippians 4, 6, we read, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 7 says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace of God. And Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let the peace of God govern your heart, rule your heart. So these are all divine blessings in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then comes the word knowledge. Knowledge. In fact, if you see in the first 11 verses, often <coughs> Peter is talking about knowledge and knowledge and knowledge and knowledge. They say ignorance is bliss, but it's not a bliss. We need to know about God. We need to know about how God thinks, His character, His work. If I have to be friendly to you, I need to understand you. Understand your character, understand your likes and dislikes. Otherwise, I cannot relate myself to you. Otherwise, I cannot develop a qualitative friendship with you. Knowledge of God should be the goal and desire and aspiration of every child of God. We seek worldly knowledge, secular, secular knowledge, that's only for a short lifetime. But once you get to know God, that's a great blessing in our life. And praise God, God reveals Himself to us. God reveals Himself to us. In fact, the fact is that none of us sought God. It is God who sought us. We only responded to God's seeking. It's God who chose us. He did not choose me, but I have chosen him. We did not love God. It's God who loved us. 1 John 4, 19, we loved him because he first loved us. He is first in loving, first in seeking, first in choosing. Everything he is first. We are only respondents. Okay, the knowledge. Now, once again, in the Bible, when you talk about the uh, Spiritual knowledge, there are two kinds of knowledge. One is theoretical. Theoretical knowledge, that's not going to really help us. Some people have a good understanding of what the Bible teaches. Scribes, for example, in the New Testament, they were thorough with the scriptures. When the wise men came to Herod and wanted to know where Jesus was born, they could on the spot give an answer, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He said, oh Herod, don't be troubled. Please send them to Bethlehem because it's written in the scriptures. They knew the word. They knew the word so thoroughly. And Bethlehem was only five miles away from Jerusalem and none of the scribes bothered to go and see Jesus. See, they were not interested in the living word. They were only interested in the written word. That's the danger. We can fall in love with the written word without getting to know the living word. Getting to know the living word is experiential knowledge. Getting to know the written word is theoretical knowledge. Theoretical knowledge does not help anyone. In fact, it brings only pride to our hearts. 
1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul says, Knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge makes you proud. We don't want that kind of a pride which offends God. God's desire is we may come into an experiential knowledge of who Christ is. So how do we know God? Now one condition that God lays before us, He shall seek me and find me when He shall search for me with all your heart. Where do you find it? Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 13. He says, He shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. See, God is more anxious to reveal Himself to us than we are. The fault is always on the human side. We are very shallow in our seeking. There is no in-depth desire, in-depth seeking. We are so half-hearted. That's the reason why we do not discover God the way we should. Okay, so grace, peace, knowledge, and then divine power. God makes it available to all of us. In our own strength, we cannot live this Christian life. Christian life is not only a difficult life, it is an impossible life. The more you try it, the more you will fail. But God makes His divine power available to us. If I can rely upon Him, I can live this supernatural life. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. You can do nothing. Nothing means nothing. Yeah. He is not mincing words. So Christian life is actually a trusting life, a dependent life. We depend upon the power of God to live with us. And that divine power has given me all things that pertain to life and godliness. The life is my secular life. Godliness is my godly life. My spiritual life, earthly life, whatever I need, God is willing to supply it because His divine power is available to me. This is one of the most comforting verses for me. When I realize how God has made His power available to me, not only to meet my spiritual needs, but my physical, intellectual, emotional needs as well. There is no area in my life which God is not willing to handle. And then Peter goes on to say, he has given us precious promises. The Bible is full of precious promises, assurances that God gives us. And these precious promises are given, why? That I may be a partaker of the divine nature. God wants to implant his very divine nature within me. Now these are all available to any person in the world. God has offered Christ and through Christ He is offering to us these ninefold blessings or we can say the ninefold things in our lives. Now we go on to the second section now. The first section is over. We have understood what all God wants to give us, how much He loves us, how much He has made available to us. Now the question comes, how does humanity respond to it? How do people respond to it? Do they receive it? Do they reject it? Yeah, so from verse 5 to 7, you find Peter talking about what I need to do or what is expected of you and me, having come to know the riches that God has made available to us. He says, add to your faith, this is the key word there, add to your faith, he says, add to it, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, Brotherly kindness, and charity. Yeah. Children, can you list out how many of them are there? Eight. 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 Hmm? Eight. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that's right. 
In Telugu, it says in verse 7, Amar Can you read that in Telugu, please? 7th verse. Chapter 1, verse 7. Bhakti and the Savadar Premanu, Savadar Premanu and the Dayanu Amar Chukonadi. Amar Chukonadi, that means uh, you add on, you add on. You add on. Now, if I really respond to the riches of Christ, I am not going to be a passive onlooker. What do I do? I begin to add to the faith that God has put in my heart, virtue, virtue is good qualities and I add on my knowledge. I have a basic elementary knowledge about God but I am not satisfied, I want to know more. More about Jesus would I know, there is a song that we sing, yeah. There is a hunger to know him more. If you love a person, if you fall in love with a person, you won't be just be satisfied just by knowing so and so's name and all that. You would like to spend time, get to know that person more and more and more because the more you know, the more you are delighted. So we want to know more of God. And then we add on temperance. Temperance is self-control. Self-control. And then patience. And then godliness. Godliness is God-centered living. Then brotherly kindness. In Christian life, in brotherhood, many times I can become very rude, but the Lord wants me to add on brotherly kindness. And then charity. Charity is a broad-based word. Love. Love for others. Love for the brotherhood. So a true believer will not keep silent in his Christian life. It is to this person in verse 10, Paul Peter is saying so clearly, if you do these things, you will never fall. If you do these things, you make your calling a direction sure. If you do these things, verse 11 says, you will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. You see there is a condition so clearly spelled out. Many times we think, oh, I am saved, somehow I am going to get to heaven someday, no matter how I live. No, the Bible does not give any room to such speculation or such thinking. If I am a real, genuine, born-again believer, a child of God, I am not going to sleep over my faith. I am going to keep adding all these things on a regular basis. I need to check out whether I am doing this on a regular basis. Christian faith will not allow me to be passive. I become proactive. Proactive in adding all these things in my Christian life. If I am not keenly doing this in my Christian life, I need to recheck on my life. I cannot blindly be comfortable saying everything is going to turn out alright. No, it won't. Because in verse 8, Oh, Peter very clearly says, what does he say in verse 8? Shall we read that verse 8? It says, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Lord Jesus Christ. So, if this addition work is going on in my life, then I will not be barren. I will not be barren. I will not be unfruitful. I will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As I was talking earlier, theoretical knowledge and experiential knowledge. Theoretical knowledge does not produce fruit. Theoretical knowledge does not produce fruit, but experiential knowledge brings fruit. And what God is looking for is fruit. In fact, one thing that distinguishes us as real children of God is fruit. This you find so clearly mentioned in Matthew's Gospel chapter 7. Two times after speaking so many things in chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7, 
when you come to chapter 7, verse 16 and verse 20, two times, you shall know them by their fruits. You shall know them by their fruits. Having said that, from verse 22, he is trying to show us what will happen in the end time. Many will say to me on that day, have you not prophesied in thy name? Have you not done many wonderful works in your name? Have you not driven out devils in your name? Then verse 23 he says, Then will I say unto them, Depart from me, ye that work in equity. Verse 22 says they did wonderful things. And they did only in the Lord's name. They did not use any devil's name. See, if they have the audacity to look into the face of Jesus Christ and say, we have done this in your name, that means they were sincere in what they were saying. They were looking to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Judge, and then they were saying it. Many. That means many are going to be deceived in the end times. Many are going to be deceived. So many, it's not few. And if you look at this list, they are all big preachers. Now what went wrong with them? What went wrong with them? They had good gifts, gifts of prophesying, gift of doing wonderful miracles, gift of driving out demons and devils. So the Lord said, ye that work in you. What iniquity did they do? So verse 21 gives us a clue where it says, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. That shows there is a possibility where I can exercise my gifts, be successful in my ministry outside the will of God. I hope you get the sequence and the sense there. It's possible for me to be successful in my ministry, to be gifted in my ministry, and yet do it outside the will of God, where God dissolves them. What God was looking for was not gifts. He was looking for fruit. That's why twice, in verse 16 and verse 20, He said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Ye shall know them by their fruits. So this is a very serious matter that we need to really keep considering and we need to be very careful about. Because Peter says, If these things be in you and abound, you shall neither be barren, nor be unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now to whom is he addressing these words? He is addressing these words to those who have understood the riches of Christ and who were not sleeping over it, but they were careful in their Christian life to keep on adding to their faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. They were constantly adding these things to their Christian life. See, you're all children. When you were born, you were very small. Then they put you into school. And from the time you entered into school, you have been adding, adding, adding to your knowledge. The kind of mathematics that you knew when you just joined the school is not the same kind of knowledge that you have today. As you grow up, they keep adding new lessons, new theorems, new formulas. And you keep learning, learning, learning. Yeah. So God wants us to grow in these things. If that addition work is not happening in a believer's life, we need to really wonder whether that person is really saved. Really saved. When you look at all those qualities which I wrote down on the board from verses 5 to 7, that speaks of Christ-likeness. Think of every characteristic. It's Christ-likeness. It is growing in Christ-likeness. There is a marked departure from iniquity. Our old lifestyle. Sure, I admit that once you are born again, you don't become a great saint overnight. That doesn't happen. But there is a growth in holiness. There should certainly be a growth in holiness in our Christian life. If that yearning for holiness is missing in our Christian life, then you need to doubt whether you are truly born again. A truly born again, regenerated person as a hunger for God, as a hunger for holiness. If these things be in you, see, he begins with the word if, 
It's a conditional word. If these things be in you and abound, ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now let's go on to the ninth verse. In the ninth verse, he talks about the other group. But he that lacketh these things, so he is, Peter is trying to distinguish the second group now. Now here is the second group. They have known the riches. At least theoretically they know what all Christ is willing to give to them. But they did nothing about it. They did not add on to their faith all the virtues, all the good things that they were expected to do. So what happens? But he that lacketh these things, what does he write? He is blind. He can't see afar off. He can't see afar off. And he has even forgotten that he is purged from his old sin. He is so short-sighted, he is so blind, he doesn't even remember about the forgiveness of sin that God has offered to him. So having told all these things, then in verse 10, Peter goes on to say, My brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Make sure you are on the right path. Make sure that you are doing this carefully in your life. If that you do carefully, reach upon your life, then he says, you shall never fall. You shall never fall. And verse 11 says, you shall have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. So, Peter makes it very, very clear. So, dearly brothers and sisters, this is a great warning to me, warning to you as well. We live in this world and I am sure ever since we believed on Christ, ever since we started reading the Bible, our great longing and desire has been that, Lord, when you come someday, I want to make sure that I enter into heaven. I want to make sure I enter into heaven. That's a good desire, but let's make sure that we are constantly working on our own lives by the grace of God that we do all these things. First Peter mentions ninefold riches that God has kept for our use. He said you can take them, you can accept them, apply them to your own lives. So one group, they work on it, so they are not barren, they are not unfruitful, they have made their calling and election sure, they have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. Whereas the second group, they are blind, they are short-sighted, they have even forgotten that God has purged their sins in the person of Jesus Christ. So these people go into ruin because they have ignored the riches that God has given to them. I often used to think of the airports and once you come out of the airport, you go to the baggage claim area. So in the baggage claim area, they tell you the belt in which your luggage arrives. Now there are two choices for me, either I can claim those luggages which belongs to me and take them or I can simply walk out. Two things are possible. Now there is something called arrival and there is something called acceptance. What has arrived must be accepted, must be appropriate. If it's not appropriated, I know it's arriving, but I am not appropriated. Now that's the pathetic condition of many believers. They are in the arrival hall, they, they are in the baggage claim area. On the belt they see all these blessings coming one after the other because of what Jesus did for them. But they don't accept it, appropriate it in their own lives. Just the knowledge of salvation is not salvation. You know all riches that God has kept for you, but what are you doing about it? Is there a definite growth in my Christian life? Is there a definite growth in my holiness? Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 19, yesterday we were thinking about that verse for a long time where it says, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from you. 
That is a sure sign, that is a sure foundation that you are a child of God. There is a definite, noticeable growth in holiness. 